Andy, my dude, have you heard of the magical website builder known as Squarespace? Ugh, not another Squarespace ad. I feel like every podcast is sponsored by them. <laughs> Hey, don't knock it till you try it. Yes, okay, it is overhyped. But actually, it lives up to the hype. Squarespace is like a website fairy godmother. With a click of a button, your site transforms into a beautiful masterpiece. A website fairy godmother? That sounds interesting. What makes it so magical? Well, for starters, those slick templates make anyone look like a professional web designer. Pick one, customize the colors and fonts to match your brand, and voila! Plus, the drag-and-drop fluid engine is so easy, your grandma could build a site on Squarespace. Well, she did knit me a lovely scarf last Christmas. Maybe website design is next. Exactly. And when you're ready to sell your Nana's handmade scarves online, Squarespace has built-in e-commerce. Add a store with one click. Get flexible payment options. Then watch those sales roll in. And when she wants to teach others her steezy scarf skills, Squarespace's new courses feature is just the ticket. Nana can set up her curriculum and enrollments and payments in a snap and become the next e-knitting influencer. Oh, wow, you really sold me with the grandma angle. Sign me up for that free try. Just go to the nextreel.com slash Squarespace and transform your site into a beautiful Squarespace masterpiece. Well, thanks, Pete. Even though it's overhyped, Squarespace actually sounds perfect for Nana's site's needs. Appreciate the warning on the ads, though. I'll brace myself next time I listen to a podcast. Anytime. Let me know if you need any help getting that site up and running. Andy, can you believe we've almost hit 700 episodes of The Next Reel? I know, it's crazy. And with all the other episodes in our family of podcasts, we are well over 1,200 episodes of movie conversation. It's really pretty amazing that we've gotten to have these in-depth movie chats every week for over a decade now. And we couldn't have done it without our loyal community of film fans. Their support over the years has meant so much. For sure. That reminds me, we should give the merch store a shout out. Buying shirts from thenextreel.com slash merch is a great way listeners can continue to support the show. Plus, they get to sport our great designs. Absolutely. I think sometimes folks forget we have a variety of shirts, mugs, phone cases, and more available. In fact, a great place to start is with a shirt sporting the Next Reel's logo. We also have that classic Fast Times Spicoli Surf School tee, or the weirdly popular Rusty's European Tour shirt. The one from National Lamp Foods European Vacation. Why is that so popular? <laughs> Search me, but we have sold a ridiculous number of those. I guess there are a lot of Rusties taking trips to Europe? We're always adding new designs based on movies we've covered, like our brand new design for a streetcar named Desire, featuring a streetcar named Desire. So if you want to rep your love of TNR and films, head to thenextreel.com slash merch. Every purchase helps us continue to have these weekly in-depth conversations. So visit thenextreel.com slash merch today. And as always, thanks for listening and being a part of the Next Real community. We've got lots more great movie chats coming your way. I'm Pete Wright. And I'm Andy Nelson. Welcome to The Next Reel. When the movie ends, our conversation begins. In just a matter of seconds, you're going to hear a classic episode of this show from back in the day when we called ourselves Movies We Like. It took us a while to settle into the show's format, so you'll notice some differences as you listen to these episodes. For instance, it takes us a bit of time to actually get into the conversation about the movie. Things like that. But we're still proud of the conversations about the movies themselves, and we think they're worth keeping in the library. So enjoy these episodes from our back catalog. And you can become part of our Discord community, learn more about the show, and find out how you can become a supporting member at thenextreel.com. So thank you, everybody, for downloading and listening to The Next Reel. We appreciate your time and attention, and we hope you enjoy the show. Push the button. <laughs> that was kind of Pepe Le Pew. I've got this. I've got this. I've got this cold right now, so it gives me a movie theater trailer voice. That's good. That's good. You should send that in somewhere. I'm. I already have. I've sent it to all of the big studios. Have you really? Nobody wrote you back, huh? Because I assume you wouldn't be here with me if they did. <laughs> <laughs> oh you that's mean wow how's your uh how's your work how's your work uh, are you how's your uh how's the documentary good. on joe good good when am i gonna see it 
Sheriff soon. Joe Arpaio. Soon, soon. Mm. <laughs> looking forward Sometime to that. Sometime in the next year. I'm looking forward to that in a big way. I feel like we've been talking about it a long time. It's going to be fun. It'll be an interesting one. Uh, this is the next real. I'm Pete. Pete Wright. And, uh, and I'm Andy. That's Andy right over there, Andy Nelson. We're but glad I'm not you Andy could... Wright. <laughs> no, you. we're glad all of you could be here with us. Uh, you should uh, uh, you should be listening to the show on iTunes where you can subscribe for free and make sure you don't miss a single episode of uh, Movie Awesome. And uh, you can head over to thenextreel.com and uh, check out the blog there. Check out uh, the, all the past episodes and detailed show notes and all the other kind of good stuff that websites are good for. Um, Facebook's where all the discussion happens. The good and kindly Steve Sarmento is also posting heavily over there. Joins us regularly on the film board. And uh, what else am I missing? I'm feeling kind of subdued. Did you talk about iTunes? Yeah, I did. That was the first thing. Were you here just now? <laughs> I was. I'm, I just thought you should not, mention it again. No, no, no. I did. That was good. I heavy upped on iTunes this morning. I, or this I like evening. to. Uh, I like to get those five star reviews. You do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> You're fueled by those five star reviews. That's right. Um. So yeah, no, I'm I I heavy up on that stuff. I'm because I'm excited to talk about our movie tonight. We're gonna be, we're we're talking about uh, 2006. Um, we're t- this originally our series was on uh, movies about magic, and the two big ones that Andy and I like so much are The Prestige and The Illusionist. And if you haven't heard this um, talk about those shows, uh, go back and listen to episodes uh, to the last two episodes uh, that you'll find on the website or in the iTunes feed. Um, we like those movies a lot. It is ironic that they were, I, I think, ironic or uh, kismet that they were both released in the same year. And it was only on researching those two movies that we discovered that we'd missed a Woody Allen movie, right? You hadn't seen this film, right? I had not, and I, I think you hadn't either. Had I had you? not. I had not. Yeah. And so this was uh, the Woody Allen's 2006 scoop. And sc- we, we had a totally different magic movie oh, picked yeah. out. Yeah, but then we decided, you know, it seemed kind of perfect to since we had three slots for magic movies. Why not talk about the three magic it, movies from two thousand six? Exactly, and so it se- seemed like something that we really um, we that it was it, it was required by the universe that we actually do all three movies from two thousand six, and whether or not we come back to uh, catch up on other magic movies in subsequent years of this show will really depend on whether or not it was worth it. To, yeah talk about scoop <laughs> <laughs> and uh so while the jury is deliberating let's talk about trailers who's first you are i'm first because you just don't want to talk about mine <laughs> I don't, you do this <sighs> i am just excited i uh, i watched this movie and i the trailer of this film and my i'm not gonna lie to you my heart beat uh faster that was a very creepy little bit at the end of the that trailer, was wasn't so, it? was so, so creepy. It was really creepy. Creepy, creepy, creepy. He has the baby. He has the baby. <laughs> has the baby. <laughs> We're talking, of course, about the new trailer for Insidious Chapter 2 that uh, just came out. The first Insidious was a great, uh, a very pleasant uh, horror surprise. <laughs> I liked quite a bit. Uh, I mean, I had my issues with it, but I had a lot of fun with it. James Wan directed it. Uh, Lee Winnell wrote it. Um, I actually had the chance to talk to the two of them after their first big breakout film, Saw, uh, came out a number of years ago. And uh, I've just, you know, they're great guys. And I've always enjoyed seeing the path that they've taken in the films that they've made. And I think that they've, you know, they've had their their misfires. But I think for the most part, they've done um, a pretty good job of coming up with some creative uh, uh, horror films that I've enjoyed quite a bit. So, um, and it looks like James Wan is actually on board to uh, to take the helm of the next in the in the Fast and Furious saga. So that'll be his next project. Wait, 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 wait! Fast and Fur- <laughs> Fast and Furious Seven. That's right. It's already in the works. What? It's going to be a series that will go on forever. This is one of the most crazy popular movie series franchises. It's crazy. That's unreal. I know. We're going to probably have to talk about the series one of these days. Don't say that. <laughs> Don't say that. I, I've, I, only, I, I've, seen, uh, I've seen four of them, I think. 
I've only seen the first two, and the second one was so bad that I didn't watch any more. But I keep hearing how good they are. Wait, so gonna... which one was Tokyo Drift? Was that that three? was number three? That was number yeah, three. yeah. And I saw, I definitely saw that one. Yeah. And uh, that's uh, that's amazing. I guess I, you know it keeps making money. This one, yeah. this uh, number six, they they uh, pull out well. all put out uh, apparently not quite all the stops if they're making a seven, but most of the stops have been pulled. I hear from from right. production of. Fast and Furious 6. I yes. don't think you can do that with real cars, what they do. <laughs> I don't think my I don't think my you Saturn I don't think my Saturn will pull those kinds of stunts. But but back to Insidious chapter two. Oh. <laughs> I, yeah, which is what we were talking about. Yeah. The trailer for this, you know, the first one is incredibly creepy. This one also looks incredibly creepy. The first one ends on, you know, one of those great horror jump moments, so you know there's gonna be more story. And uh, they pick up from that, and it, uh, you know, looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Same cast is coming back. You got Rose Byrne, Patrick Wilson, the same kid. You got Barbara Hershey. I, I just uh, think it's going to be a lot of fun, and I just can't wait. I'm, I'm excited for you. I can't wait to hear what you think about it. September 13th, Friday the 13th is coming out. Of course it is. Of course. Uh... Goodness. Can't wait for it. <laughs> uh, and because of that, my title is an actual uh, retribution uh, trailer as well. <laughs> That's right. Um, and uh, this one is because I know your fondness for Luc Besson films, uh, that uh, we have the uh, September 20th release of The Family, uh, written and directed, uh, directed by Luc Besson, written by Tonino Benacquista, who wrote the novel, apparently, and uh, Luc Besson. And Malavita, and according Mal- to the the credits in the in the trailer, uh, also co-wrote the novel. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, Mal- there's just is. lots of co-writing. Mm. Lots of team writing in this film. The cast is interesting. Robert De Niro, Michelle Pfeiffer, and Tommy Lee Jones uh, headline the cast. Uh, we know now what Diana Agron has been doing in her hiatus, her various uh, hiatuses from Glee. She is the daughter in this film. Uh, it is a family story. Boy, does she story. terrify me. <laughs> she is, uh, she's uh, unwell. Don't mess with her. She she and, and her brother are, are mm-hmm. unwell in this film. This is a tale of a mafia family uh, who's put in witness protection. And where do they go? To France. And so there they are in France, and it's about the havoc the havoc that they uh, they raise. Do they raise havoc? What do you do with havoc? You gotta uh, do something with havoc. I'm missing a. I think you I'm raise. Missing it. an idiom. Yeah, you raise havoc, don't All you? Right. Reek. You raise. Wreak you havoc. wreak havoc. You Thank raise you. cane. Hmm. There you, you go. Wreak havoc, raise cane, and both of that those sounds, things. That sounds like a movie title. Wreaking havoc and raising cane. cane. Uh, and so they do all of these things in france and and uh it ends up being a uh, just a violent explosive all around uh besson french action spectacular i'm very much looking forward to it it looks like a a a lot of fun i like seeing uh, de niro in it uh, as always and um yeah i think it's been a while since i've seen michelle pfeiffer uh in in a film and it just every time i see her i makes me think of the fabulous baker boys Every time I see her, I fall in love with her again. Yep, yep, yep. Just in, love in, her. In the fabulous Baker Boys. <laughs> that's that's or my, her cav- cat my caveat to everything. <laughs> yeah, she, um, she, she, was, she had a great spell in the 80s and 90s. She, she really did. She certainly did. So I'm very excited for this film. I think, it's, I think it looks great. I like Luc Besson more than you did, and I have you. I wish I had you on the record because just minutes ago you said, okay, that looks kind of good. I didn't say kind of good. I said that looks really good. You did? I don't think yeah. you said really. You yeah, sound well, now, much more enthusiastic now, now. Now you have it on record. I am actually quite excited about this. This actually looks like a really good film. I am going to make very that. very excited. Say that one more time. <laughs> no. I'm you, making you, it. No, it's going to be my ringtone. <laughs> uh, I am very excited. This? I am very excited. Me likey. <laughs> <laughs> done. Ringtone. Done. <laughs> that's what we're uh that's what we're excited about coming up uh i you know i want to add uh i want to add something this is a this is a spontaneous trailer discussion spontaneous oh. trailer um it, you know we do we've i've mentioned a couple of video game trailers in the past um that i i found particularly interesting um but there was a uh you know the xbox one is the new 
Xbox, you know, Xbox gaming machine that's coming out for Microsoft. They're going to announce more about it this uh, uh, next week at uh, the Electronic Entertainment Expo in Vegas. And the, uh, one of their launch titles is Call of Duty uh, Ghosts, right? Have you heard of this thing? No. Or maybe it's Modern Warfare. Call of Duty Ghosts, 2013 video game. And... Um, I'm not going to be able to get his name right because you, uh, you know, as the holder of all things, uh, uh, of all pronunciations, his his name is Stephen Gagan, I believe. G-A-G-H-A-N, yeah. right? Stephen Gagan. Yeah, uh, he's one of my faves. He's one of your faves, right? I know this. I, I He uh, wrote Traffic uh, and uh, co-wrote Traffic. He also wrote the uh, the video game uh, Call of Duty Ghosts. And and if you haven't seen the trailer for this thing, uh, you you need to go see just... Uh, we'll put the link in the show notes the, the, to the uh, YouTube launch trailer for Call of Duty Ghosts. It's, uh, it, it is, um, you know... It's right up there at the top of fantastic, uh, you know, cinematic military trailers, um, nice. and, and it's coming for this video game. You can tell it's just got such a story, uh, a deep uh, story to it. There is another one for the PlayStation 4 uh, that looks equally good, and I uh, suddenly it's totally escaping me what the name of it is, um, uh, but it's one that has a, about the most... Um, invested oh last of us that that's another one we're going to put in there and that's actually for for ps3 it's not for the ps4 it's another game uh, last of us where uh it, it's one of those um end of civilization uh games like 12 years after you know the fall of civilization and so there's a little girl and there's a guy and a woman and they're trying to make their way across the country running from uh infected uh, zombie like people and um but in, until you see the trailer and game footage, you don't quite realize the humanity that they put into this game. It's I, I think this is this next cycle of of game machines is is um, we're we're climbing up off of a of a plateau we've been on for a while in terms of the um, the intricacy of storytelling, and um, I, I think the next climb is gonna it, it's gonna make um, it's gonna be we're we're gonna see some pretty compelling stories. So well, Last you know, of Us and Call of Duty Ghosts. It's quite a uh, a money making machine, vi the video game industry. So you can yeah. see why a lot of people like Stephen Gagan, Oscar winner Stephen Gagan, Oscar are, winner right. are jumping over and working in that yeah. industry now. Yeah. Um, okay, that's all I've got on. Do you have anything? Any other? Uh, any other old business? Nope. All right. Let's move on to a uh, new business. Let's. So scoop. <laughs> right. Um, Scoop. Okay, <laughs> so you know it's Woody Allen, and there are some things that are uh, that that come with Woody Allen that are fairly pretty. Do you mind uh, if I if I launch into this a little bit? You I, take can I go first? The helm. You go first. All right. Uh, so you know it, we did this because it's in the middle of our magic series, and so you know obviously it's going to have something to do with magic. Uh, it is Woody Allen. It's also a comedy as a function of being Woody Allen. And as it happens, as with many Woody Allen films, it's, there's also a kind of a murder mystery that goes on there. So it is a a, a magical murder mystery comedy. And I, I haven't yet figured out the, the just the perfect concatenation of all those to create a new subgenre, but I'm sure it'll come <laughs> as a result of this film. Uh, but I, I've been thinking about it in terms of those three kind of areas and how does the film function in, in those three broad categories, right? So first, uh, in terms of its use of magic, sticking with our theme, uh, you, you know, Alan plays Splendini. The, uh, you know, he's a, a stage magician, um, sleight of hand magician, you know, box magician. He does all the, the standard sort of tricks. Um, and as such, magic is not a central cast member of this film as it was in in the prestige you know when the when the film really is about or a function of the magic that's going on on stage it was right. it was very powerful it is it's neither really a setting uh, as it was in The Illusionist, right, where magic was just sort of the overall environment, but really the story was a love story. And and, and so it was kind of a different take on how magic was applied in the storytelling of, of The Illusionist. Um, and, and so without it being really a functionary or a setting, it's left as this sort of sideshow and both literally and figuratively 
uh, only really serving as kind of an excuse to move this otherwise plotting crime story uh, along for us. And so in that respect, magic, you know, isn't really a, a player. So how does it function then as a murder mystery? Well, uh, you know, it, it's sort of a rehearsal of the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not rehearsal, a reversal of the complexities that we saw in uh, The Prestige and The Illusionist, and certainly in our very special episode, uh, Now You See Me, which went way the other way in terms of complexity. Uh, this is a massive oversimplification of the most trite uh, a murder mystery that you know you could craft. It is mm-hmm. it is the textbook murder mystery from the moment you meet him. Hugh Jackman did it. I'm sorry if you wanted to see <laughs> this. You know he did it, and you know Scarlett Johansson was going to fall for him, and you know somehow that Woody Allen would end up on the barge of death before. <laughs> I mean, the moment the movie opens, you know that there's, those three things are going to happen, and you don't necessarily have to be cynical. You just have to be awake to figure out if those uh, to figure out those three. Um, uh, whodunits. And and so it, it doesn't really work as a, as a murder mystery for me. And finally, as a comedy, uh, you know, you expect it to be a Woody Allen film, and I wanted so desperately for to, to laugh uh, at this film. And, uh, you know, Allen has some of his great zingers, you know, converting from being a Jew to being a narcissist. is You know, those are some great one-liners that, that you find him throwing out uh, about. But um, overall, I couldn't get over this fact or this this tendency for Woody Allen's main characters to be written so much in his own uh, in his own image that they're no longer funny. Scarlett Johansson is a female Woody Allen in this film, and it's extremely difficult to watch. It's it's not funny, um, and uh, and and so it it falls flat. I think on all three fronts, this film falls flat. I'm done. Yeah. You, yeah. What do you got? My assessment of this film, I I don't, I, I agree with you on all counts, <laughs> every point that you have. Um, but even with it falling flat for me, I didn't dislike it. I I felt it, you know, it was enjoyable enough to go through. It didn't hurt me in any way. <laughs> yeah, like it it didn't it, it didn't pain me. I didn't have a problem with uh, Scarlett Johansson um, in, intrinsically in the nature of her kind of being this this comedic Woody Allen character, um, I, Woody, Woody Allen-esque type of character. I enjoyed seeing her doing something a little different, actually, even though I don't think she did it that well. Um, but it was nice to just see her doing something different. I, I think for for that, I, I found a little, you know, more interest in watching Scarlett Johansson just trying something, even if it was, even if it wasn't quite right for her. Uh, and um, the whole thing felt very stagey to me. Everything on the uh, the barge of death felt like I was watching a stage show. It all just had that look. It, it I mean, this was a very low budget film. We'll we'll talk numbers more a little later but it, i mean it was a very low budget like 15 dollars l- l- well, 4 million it was, four, it was okay it was it's a pretty little, low. little more than 15 but 4 million which is yeah. in today's standards i mean hugh jackman alone got paid 20 million for his role in wolverine right and that's five times the budget of this film you know it it's not a lot of money but you know woody allen makes these movies on very low budgets they make their money back and that's why he keeps cranking them out every year or two I, you know, I guess, you know, my sense of this film is, you know, the magic was not really magical. I mean, you know, the the one caveat to that is of all the magicians that we've seen in all of the films we've talked about magicians in, this is the only film where a magician in a way ends up actually doing some real magic by by doing his trick. And it actually unintentionally probably, but brings back a guy from the dead. And I don't know if I'd call that his magic, but it just uh, yeah. happens to happen in his trick. So maybe I'm giving him credit where it's not due. <laughs> but <laughs> but still, at least there's some real real magical thing happening in this film, which hasn't been in the other films. Well, there was um, magic going on in the other. What are you talking about? It was it was illusion. You know, it was all uh, uh, the, the right. prestidigitation. Whereas this, you know, it, you know, bringing the guy back from the dead. You know, what can I say? Hey, Tesla man, they made copies of people. Oh, wow, that's that science. That was pure science. <laughs> that's going to be my next ringtone. 
Yeah. <laughs> that was pure science. That was pure science. <laughs> so, but, but on the whole, yeah. like I wasn't pained by this movie. Like I was watching Now You See Me. And maybe it was because I was really looking forward to Now You See Me. And I have certain expectations that are already kind of on a lower level when I watch Woody Allen movies, which is, I probably shouldn't have lower expectations because it is Woody Allen. He's made some great films. But, you know, in recent years, I don't think, uh, I haven't been a, as much a fan of his. And Well, see, and on that front, you and I disagree because I, you know, I'm a huge fan of Midnight Over Paris. And I, right. I think that's one of my very favorite Woody Allen films. And And for me, you know, having not seen Scoop prior to this week, uh, I feel like Midnight in Paris harkens back to you know the, the greats, the Annie Halls, the Manhattans, you know the 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 Woody Allen of the seventies. Um, yeah, sure, and you know, I mean, you're right. I think in a large part, Midnight in Paris is probably the you know a, a step in the right direction for him. But you know, he when you crank out films as often as he does every you know year or two years, you're bound to have hits and misses. It's not always going to be you know perfect quality films. And we it's, we should we should underscore. I mean, he's uh, as a writer, uh, it, you know, he's got seventy one titles to his name as a director, forty nine, uh, you know, an actor, forty four. He's he's an extremely prolific filmmaker so from you know from the nineteen fifties um, and sixties. Well, I mean, you know, he was he's got a lot of TV. Um, oh, sure. He was a TV writer from starting in nineteen fifty. Uh, writer for Sid Caesar. You know, I mean he's he's been around for a long time and so you know everybody has cycles yeah absolutely uh and and you know there are some things that are really very woody allen charming in this film that i that i think he does very well and and for example the the barge of death i think is a uh a, i i think it's fantastic i really like the idea of it it's like the the closest thing to um, you know, to my conception of death that I've seen on film so far, you know, <laughs> uh, it is, it, it's a great, uh, it, it's a great bit. And I think that's the, the charm that Woody Allen tends to bring to these projects, which is, um, you know, we're going to take the supernatural and we're going to make it absolutely as pragmatic and earthbound as we can. Um, it, you know, it, and he's been doing it since, you know, everything you want to know about sex, but we're afraid to ask, you know, I mean, we're the, the uh, you know, the sperm characters were, you know, the, you know, as a Jewish sperm. I mean, it was just a fantastic bit that mm -hmm. that takes this sort of stuff that you can't conceive of and make it really very human yeah. um, and and i like the charm of that i like the charm of his splendini character um and uh, but so so there's I, I think there is stuff to like here but like you say like i you know it didn't pain me it's like i'm a diabetic but my toes haven't quite started to fall off yet like it, it's it's a movie that doesn't necessarily affect me but it doesn't do a whole lot of good to me either yeah you know i i happened upon this website which is actually, uh, you know, if you're a fan of Woody Allen, uh, is probably a website you should check out. EveryWoodyAllenMovie.com, <laughs> where this <laughs> this guy named uh, what was his name, Trevor, a website development uh, by day guy, uh, basically went through every single Woody Allen film chronologically and wrote up reviews of them. And I think he sums it up really well in this line in the opening of his uh, bit about Scoop. Um, watching Woody Allen's mid 2000s movies is a lot like watching a band on a half assed greatest hits tour. If you're a big <laughs> enough fan, it's fun just watching them go through the motions. But if you're a casual fan or a non fan, nothing could be a bigger waste of time. And that's really the best way I can think of uh, to describe Scoop. The truth is, I enjoyed it. But I'm also a guy with his own Woody Allen fan site. If I force myself to think about it intellectually, I have to admit that Scoop is almost entirely devoid of artistic worth. So, you know, on the surface level, yeah, you know, it's, it's you know, a, a very slight, you know, kind of easy to watch and easy to forget type of film. Here's the, 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 the um, some other reviews uh, that uh, I was, I was kind of playing with. First of all, I always start with, um, you know, with the, the Ebert and um, I, I particularly like this bit. 
Does it mean anything anymore to describe a new Woody Allen movie as a, quote, minor Woody Allen, end quote? He's been stuck in minor for so long, Matchpoint looked like major to some. Bullets Over Broadway was a delightful comedy, but in 1994 it seemed lightweight, even compared to Love and Death, after the likes of Celebrity, Small Time Crooks, Jade Scorpion, Hollywood Ending, and the aptly titled, aptly titled Anything Else. You wonder what Allen could possibly mean when he says Scoop will be his last comedy. Uh, yeah. which, you know, I think that's a, that's a funny thing. But then in, in contrast to that, we have, um, uh, Mick, Mick LaSalle of the San Francisco Chronicle who says, uh, and I just have to read this, the, the whole, whole bit. Yeah. It's pretty funny. Scoop has something match point. Didn't something that none of Alan's films have had uh, quite to this degree in 10 years. It's really, really funny, not funny, hehe, <laughs> but Laugh out loud funny. Funny like you walk out wanting to tell your friends its best lines. Funny like you're walking down the street and remember a moment and start laughing like an idiot. That's probably very accurate. <laughs> Woody Allen has written himself an ideal role, creating a character and a situation that result in a continuous stream of winning bits. And he's paired himself with a partner in Scarlett Johansson who brings deafness and freshness to Allen's familiar comic universe. Yeah. Uh, in contrast, Stephen Hunter, The Washington Post, basically the movie decodes into a Hardy Boys level mystery. It's not, of course, that comedies must display documentary realism of this sort of thing. You forgive anything in a movie if it's funny. Scoop is never funny enough, except for the odd whiny Allen jibe. It, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I, the contrast well, in these. Uh, and he these goes movies. on to say it's, it's Woody Allen's worst movie ever made. That's true. So, <laughs> yeah, I saying, mean, <laughs> yeah. the truth it's, must be faced. It's, uh, you know, it's it's interesting. There, I think there's probably more people who. I, I mean, I from looking at the reviews, I think that those are very extreme in both cases. The, the rest of them seem kind of just, you know, middling to low. But right. nobody seems to outright hate it as much as Stephen Hunter. Nobody seems to outright love it like Mick LaSalle does. So, right. it's interesting. You know, it's an interesting little film, and you know, I don't know. I mean, it's. Well, I, I, I feel know. like, we, you know, we need to talk. Let's first talk about Scarlett Johansson. Uh, you know, she plays the um, uh, she plays the the journalism student who uh, happens on a big scoop when the spirit of a dead reporter appears to her in a magic trick in the great Splendini's show and says, I have a I have a scoop. Mm -hmm. And it, that's Play, and that's the Ian McShane. Played Ian McShane. Yeah. Um, and so the scoop is uh, that Peter Lyman, who's a son of a lord in uh, in London, is uh, the tarot card killer, and now she's on the hunt to try to uncover the murder or yeah. these the series of murders. And so, what, what do you think of of Scarlett Johansson? You say she's not she wasn't as offensive as I find her portrayal of a feminine Woody Allen. It, and again, it's just because I think for me, I just find it refreshing to see her doing something different. It's it's not a I, I didn't find it to be a painful performance. Uh, my wife found it very painful. I didn't find it painful. I I just enjoyed seeing her doing something a little different than what she does otherwise, which is really just, you know, seems to be now what? more of the, the, the action stuff. Right. Yeah. Well, what? you know, I guess she does have match point. And I was going to say, what did you what did you yeah. think of uh, match point? I liked her in both of those films and I liked both of those films. As but, did I. Yeah. A match point was was something different. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. So you, but usually you like her, right? Usually yeah. you're you like Scarlett Johansson because there are people who are kind of the binary folks. They don't, they just don't, don't find what she does good. No, I I like her. I mean, okay. I've I've you know I think that she's done lots of films that I I, I really enjoy. Uh, and I mean, the girl with the pearl earring is I thought a fantastic film. I think she did a great job in that. Um, I mean, going all the way back to um, uh, the Horse Whisperer. I mean, I, I generally have always enjoyed seeing her on screen. I think she uh, does a good job. What was and, that? What was that sci-fi thing that Ewan McGregor? Uh, what was that called? Yeah, the Island. Yeah, yeah, the Island. Michael Bay. Michael um, Bay. You know, <laughs> that's a, a terrible <laughs> film. That was actually a film I I felt would have been a really interesting, like low budget indie type of film. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to the giant over the top Michael Bay spectacle that he turned it into, yeah. because I liked the concept. I just think Michael Bay had no idea what to do with it, and I didn't. I didn't think she did a good job in that, but I didn't think anyone did a good job. In that. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, all right, fair enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about uh, Hugh Jackman? 
this was really, I think, one of his most bland roles I've ever seen him in. You know, he's done uh, much more interesting work, clearly, in 2006. We've already talked about the prestige and how I, I think he really brought a lot to that. This is just incredibly bland. He's this British son of a lord. And, you know, maybe or maybe not this killer, which is it is pretty obvious that he he did it or in some way is is despicable and going to do something bad. And uh, I don't know. I just I really thought it was just a nondescript character and it could have been played by a nobody. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it probably should have been. Uh, That's one of the things that I kept uh, uh, coming back to in this film, that uh, the the part, the way it was written is um, it, casting Hugh Jackman in this role makes it uh, sort of deceptively important, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it ends up being marginally important through the, you know, not as important as Hugh Jackman's casting in it would have led one to believe. Right. Um, it really could have been played by a you know a new face and and not um, and not been quite so. Um, I, I don't know, bland. I think it did not do it. It did not do wonders for for him. Certainly, there was no there was no real range for it. It was it was as Kevin Costner performance as I've ever seen. Well, and that's that's in a film where he has a lot of names in it, and I, you know maybe this is what happens when you're Woody Allen. He can put people like Hugh Jackman in a, a role of little importance. I mean, he certainly does that yeah. with plenty of other people in this film. Um, you know, big name people like uh, Julian Glover mm-hmm. is, I mean, he's just like almost just a, I mean, he's, uh, he's Hugh Jackman's father. He's in for like one little scene and then he disappears and that's it. Charles Dance is in mm-hmm. uh, very briefly. You know, these people come on, uh, you know, these Woody Allen movies just, just to be in a Woody Allen movie. I think that's probably why they do it. And it, it sometimes it does disservice to the film when you get, people in roles that seem by putting a person of that caliber in that role, all of a sudden you're placing more of an importance on that role because it is that person and it doesn't help the story. Well, and I, you know, I should take a step back and ask, do you, I mean, do you agree with that uh, assessment? Because in the end he is the murderer and do you think it would, it, it actually, do you think that was a service or disservice casting him as, casting Hugh Jackman as the character that ends up being the murderer. I, well, I, you know, I think it was a disservice. Unless okay. you're going to write the character to be more interesting. It's such a bland role that it's like, okay, well, he, he's... It's such a bland role that it's kind of... It has to be apparent that he is the killer, because otherwise, you know, why is this factoring into yeah. the story? Okay. There's no I, other that's, reason. Yeah, that's good. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same yeah. page. I wasn't Absolutely. You know, putting words in your mouth. Right? No. Um, uh, okay, so, and then, uh, you know, Woody Allen himself, you found, uh, as, uh, did you fall in love with the great uh, Splendini? It, you know, it, he's as Woody Allen as ever, and, I mean, I always enjoy watching him. He always throws out, you know, pretty funny lines, and... Uh, it's it's fun to watch him babbling on screen. It, sometimes it works better than other times. I, you know, this time might have been a little worse. But you know, oddly enough, I did find his uh, uh, his repartee with Scarlett Johansson enjoyable when they kind of take these this these fake identities as a father daughter team. I, you know, I don't know. They they played off of each other well, even though uh, Scarlett Johansson had to deliver lines to him sometimes that just that felt too Woody Allen like yes you are a cynical crepe hanger who always sees yes. the glass half empty I'm like Scarlett Johansson would never use the word crepe hanger <laughs> I mean or, or glass <laughs> or any hyphenate <laughs> oh. <laughs> I uh no I agree with you and I think that's one of the things over the course of the film that you, once they take on this shared mantle of father-daughter crime fighters um, it, it, her performance sort of to me degrades the more she becomes like, uh, like Woody. Um, you know when she is on screen with her, you know her dear friend that she's staying with. What's her um, uh, anyway at their at their house and not with Woody early in the film. I found her much more interesting when she's talking about you know the she's going in and shopping around this this story that she's landed uh when she is uh, toward the end when she's now uh given up the 
facade and has come clean to to Peter Lyman's character and has said, you know, I'm telling the truth now. This is my real name. I'm not Jade Spence. I'm I'm now the real uh, the real woman. And let's go ahead and and go away to your to your cottage. Uh, you know, I found her more interesting there, even though totally unbelievable. Yeah, uh, but that you know that's more of a function of the fact that I was completely lost on the story, or not lost. I'd given up on being interested in the story. Yeah, by right, point. right, so. exactly. Okay, yeah. I you know I uh, yeah the, the movie sort of is what it is. It's a small movie, and to me, it's a disappointing movie uh, to wrap up the first half of our magic heist series. Um, you know, on on a rather anemic note. But, you know, it's it was interesting to see. I mean, Woody Allen, despite the fact that, you know, I, I do find him kind of hit or miss, he is one of those filmmakers that I, I do enjoy filling in the gaps. I, I like to go back and fill in all the little things I've missed and see them. I mean, it's a Woody Allen film. He still has some funny lines, and, and now I've seen it, and I can check it off my Woody Allen list. <laughs> <laughs> That is, uh, that's, uh, that's exactly my feel. And, and going back through this catalog of 70 some odd movies, you know, I, I have a lot to fill in, uh, decades yeah. to fill in. Um, you know, I went through, I, I think in the nineties, I went through an early Woody Allen, uh, fetish. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I went to college. My first college was soon, mm. was soon ye. Hmm. Do you know that? Did I ever tell you I that didn't. story? I did. Right. Suni Praven, his his now wife. That's uh, yeah. But that was during the uh, during the whole, uh, you know, scandal. Right. The scandal where he, uh, yeah, his now he when he ran away with her and uh, the Mia Farrow kind of thing, and so that, that's when I went through my first big Woody Allen fetish, and I went back and watched all of the sixties and seventies kind of earliest a- ones. That's an odd time and an odd reason to kind of all of a sudden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. It it really is not. Uh, I I didn't say I was a well person. <laughs> I was not a well person. Yeah. No, but it was. Uh, you know, I I haven't really gone through the the process. I've seen. You know, the modern Woody. Uh, I have not given a whole lot of attention to. Uh, mm-hmm. So I feel like I need to go back and, like you say, fill in some blanks. Yeah. You know, interestingly. Scarlett Johansson's role as Sandra was originally not written for her. It was written for, I, I've read different things. I've read it was written for an older woman. I've read it was written for an older man. But but not out, a young student. But a, not a young student. And after he worked with her on Match Point, he saw something in Scarlett Johansson, this sense of humor that he said had never been tapped into before. He really enjoyed that. And so he rewrote the part for her for this to be this young student so that it would fit her and uh that's uh you know he did that for her after match point and and that's why they ended up working together on this one yeah you know she's i i think you know he it's funny uh, the whole idea that he found something funny in her yeah. uh when and i don't know obviously it's quite <laughs> subjective <laughs> didn't find anything really funny about the film at all uh, there's no accounting for taste. You, you know, I I didn't I didn't not laugh. I had I had a few little chuckles. So you know, it it like I said, it it didn't pain me. It was it was light and uh, forgettable. <laughs> what movie were we talking about again? Yeah, right. <laughs> so you say the movie made four million dollars? No, I said. I mean, it was, it was made the, for. $4 million. Made for four million dollars. <laughs> Oddly enough, the the uh, prints and advertising budget was sixteen million dollars. Wow, four times the budget. So total budget was twenty million dollars. It actually did uh, pretty well for itself. Uh, for I mean, Woody Allen films, you know, domestically it made ten and a half million. Internationally, it made almost thirty million. So it made about forty million total. So it about doubled its budget. And for a movie that's only about 96 minutes long, it made a profit of $201,827 per finished minute. Wow. It still didn't beat The Illusionist or The Prestige in uh, profit per minute, but, you know, it beat out Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> Not bad. Yeah. Not bad. I didn't... Did you see anything that of note in the... You know, Remy uh, Adafarasin? 
mm-hmm. uh, the cinematography of this film. Did you see anything of note that really jumped out of you as per- particularly, um, you know, stand, uh, you know, stand no, out it, tricks uh, for I, the th- cinematography? It, yeah. You know, it looked very uh, bland, very you know, made for TV almost. Nothing like what he did with Woody Allen in Matchpoint, which I thought was a much better looking film. Or even about a boy, Elizabeth. I mean, geez, even, you know, In Good Company, Johnny English. I mean, those films probably looked better than this film. But again, you know, we're talking about a $4 million film. This was, I mean, even in Woody Allen's, you know, this, this, I should jump back to this uh, thing uh, that uh, Trevor wrote on every Woody Allen movie. Because let me, he had something to say about that as far as budgets. Um, I think it was him. Yeah. Um, this interiors, which Woody Allen made, I don't remember, uh, how early that was what 78 he did interiors. He did that film for $10 million. Um, his first four comedies in the two thousands had an average cost of $19.5 million. So even for Woody Allen, this was a really, really low budget film. So it's amazing that he did it for this amount of money. It's amazing he still got the cast that he did. Do you, you know? do you have quick access to prints and advertising and budget for Midnight in Paris? I, I will have that in momentarily. The, you know, I, I think that's another interesting one, though, because that, was, uh, that movie, to me, appears vastly more sophisticated. And sure. cinematography was done by your favorite mind, Darius Kanji. The the production budget for Midnight in Paris was seventeen million dollars. So over the four million. Yeah. But you could you could just I you know I walked away from that movie just feeling much more um, intimate relationship with Paris and with the the setting and with the the facilities the architecture the you know like I was much more involved in the you know, the small room sequences. And that yeah. was that was a sense that I walked away with from, obviously, from Panic Room. Um, you know, yeah. you get that same feeling from Seven and the crime scenes. Like, th- those were the things that we've talked about so many times when you look at at the the sort of the the visual strategy of these films. And, and you know, this one, like you say, it's, it's, um, it's, it strikes me as very sort of Polaroid in the most generic sense, not the look what I can do with Polaroid kind of sense. Well, and he didn't even, ha- I mean, uh, Manhattan Murder Mystery, another yeah. little murder yeah. uh, story that he did in the, uh, when was that, the mid-90s or so, um, was a, uh, he didn't even play, like visually play around with it. Like that one had, like if you, there was a, a bus that went by and there was a word on the side of the bus that, that would point you to the killer. And he really played around with that sort of stuff in that film that made it a really fun film to watch. Yeah. This film just, I mean, there's nothing about any of that. It was all just about this, you know, the, 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 it was really a very rudimentary plot in this film that, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't know. If it's a film that I would, I, I certainly not a film I'd ever return to. I don't know if it's a film I would really recommend to people, unless unless you're a Woody Allen person and or a completionist, and you really just need to see it. The big question is: Would you watch this before you would watch Rush? <laughs> yeah, that is the big question, isn't it? Or, or an even bigger question: Would you watch this before you would watch Now You See Me? I would watch the Now You See Me before this. I think. I don't know. I think we're I knew I think we need to dig in. We need to flick chart this thing. The um you know, there's always these different reasons. Like why would I watch that movie again? That you know, I would now you see me for me. I would I will definitely watch Now You See Me, even though I you know, I've had to choke back my insult at wanting to love that film much more than I did. Um you know, I'll watch it again for the spectacle of it. I am not, I was thinking about this before, um, you know, I think, it, was it Steve who made some, you know, ridiculously snide comment about um, Man of Steel being a big budget movie and how he's tired of that. Did he, was it he, Steve who said that? I don't remember. Well, I think he did. I'm going to blame Steve on that. I've been thinking <laughs> about that uh, that comment all week long. And I, I think the real trick for me is, I am. I'm not a man who's afraid to like a Transformers movie. 
Yeah. I'm not gonna I'm I'm not gonna lie to you. I, I enjoy I enjoy myself a Transformers movie from time to time. Yeah, uh, I, I hear you. to that, but I have a good time watching it. Um and so I will watch Now You See Me Again with that same sense of this is total nonsense. It broke my heart the first time I saw it, but that doesn't mean we can't be friends. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I probably would too. I probably would watch Now You See Me. Um, I, I, I would say I will probably never seek out Now You See Me to put it on again, but I would say the same thing about Scoop. <laughs> 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 but it, but if the two were playing on TV side by side, one yeah, of them it, you're going to have to actively choose not to watch. I I would probably pick I'd probably pick Now You See Me. Yeah. All right. That's true. All right. Let's rank it. All right. Scoop or Cloud Atlas. Cloud Atlas. I feel I like we just need a buzzer. That's right. Uh, Clute. Clute. Scoop or Oz the Great and Powerful. Oh. I would watch I, Oz I, the Great and Powerful. I, I so badly want to say Scoop, but I can't. You can't. Uh, God, I hated Oz. <laughs> I know. I know. Race to the bottom. The Fifth Element. <laughs> say it. Yeah. Say it out loud. The Fifth Element. And here we, now we are down at the bottom. Now you see me or Scoop. <laughs> now you see me. <laughs> and Rush or Scoop. Scoop. Thank you, yes. Oh, All right, man! Wow, race to the bottom. You're not kidding. Ninety-one out of ninety-two. Yikes! Yeah. Well, you know, this is Woody Allen's worst-rated film. Yeah. On, so what, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has, I think, thirty-nine percent. It's his lowest uh, critical review of all of his films that he's ever made. Uh, hey, what did you say? Uh, uh, now you see me had on Rotten Tomatoes. Oh, it's. I think it's lower than that, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. When, I, when when I saw it, I thought you said it was right around there, 38, 37, 39, somewhere in there. Anyway. Let me go look. I'm going to look right now. It's, it, it's a funny, I don't know, it's funny that we would end up uh, landing on a review of Woody Allen's uh, lowest rated film. I'm very much looking forward to getting back into the uh, movies that we have seen and like. And that's what's coming next. Yeah, 46% is now you see me. Oh, good Lord, it's gone up. Yeah, it actually has increased. I think it was 38% yeah. when I told you about it last. What are we doing uh, What are we doing next week? Well, you know, we we now, even though we're a week, uh, because they, you know, the schedule always changed with now you see me, we're a week behind with our, uh, with our switch from the magicians to the heist films. Right. Now you see me was our pivot point for that. Uh, now we're going into heist films, so we've got uh, a, a few fun heist films to watch, and quite looking forward to them. Are we going to talk about what what we're going to do next week? Well, do I you think hide this, it. I think we should say all four of them. I'm I'm with you. Do it. I think we should say them, and then I think we should ask all of our listeners to go to our Facebook page or shoot us an email listing some of their favorite heist films or tweet us, whatever is uh, your uh -huh. preference. Yeah. Let us know and we'll, uh, maybe we'll swap one out. You never know. Are we, should we, we'll, just any one of them will swap out? Because there are some that I, I want to do. Oh, I think we, I really want to do all four. We'll, we'll have to play this by ear and see if we have a really popular one that everyone wants and then you and I can chat about it and see. Or maybe we add a fifth film to our high series. I'd be open to that, too. There you go. All right. All right. So uh, next week, at this point, the pl as the plan stands. Next week, we're doing The Bank Job. Now and that then, was the uh, that was from, what year was that from? It was That not, was 2008, was it? I think or it was 11? 2007 or 8. For, yeah. This was uh, Jason Statham, the, yeah. based on the, the London jewel right. heist. Yeah. I'm very uh, much looking forward to talking about that one. Excellent. Uh, the next one is The Town. Mm -hmm. Also looking forward to talking about that one. Very much looking forward to talking about that one. Actually, and, all of these I am. Uh, me too. Uh, and then we're going to be doing uh, The Inside, Inside Man. Man. I'm oh, I'm so excited about this one. And finally, uh, at this point, we are looking at The Killing. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick. Uh, cool. Stanley Kubrick. And that'll be our 4th of July. Uh, explosive. Explosive 4th of July <laughs> Uh, extravaganza, heist extravaganza. Right. So, uh, but it, you know, obviously, we are 
you know, we these are just the the films that we've picked off our giant uh, compendia of uh, movies that we want to talk about. But if there are other movies that you're interested in hearing, uh, in in carrying on a conversation uh, about, we want to hear it. So we'll post a poll up on the Facebook page and would love to hear your thoughts. And, uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think that's uh, I think that's it. I think so. I think we've covered every nook and cranny that we could of Scoop. Every nook and cranny that was obviously visible and interesting. <laughs> that's right. Um, that's it. So uh, head over to thenextreel.com and facebook.com slash thenextreel to contribute in dialogue, and we'll catch, you, uh, we'll catch you next week. Anything else? Are you done? I am so done. Put a fork in it. We wanted to take a moment to thank you for your continued support over the years. It's hard to believe that we've been having weekly in-depth discussions about movies since 2011. That's right. 12 years and counting. Producing this show is a labor of love for us, but it does require a lot of time and effort each week. If you enjoy our podcast and would love to help keep it going, there are some easy ways you can show your support. One is by using our Originals page to shop for the original source material that movies we've discussed were based on. That's right. In season one alone, we covered 13 films adapted from books or plays, from Charlie Kaufman's adaptation to David Fincher adaptations like Fight Club. In season two, we covered even more, like Powell and Pressburger's The Red Shoes and The African Queen from our series about legendary cinematographer Jack Cardiff. We can't forget about the four Jason Bourne movies we talked about. Love those movies. Well... The original trilogy, at least. <laughs> for our Richard D. Zanuck series, we did Jaws, Rush, Big Fish, and more. And for our horror series, we talked about John Carpenter's The Thing, which was adapted from Who Goes There? We did our first great car chase series with movies like Bullet, The French Connection, and Drive. And for the holidays, we did Preston Sturgis's Christmas in July. We had a great John Huston series with adaptations like The Maltese Falcon and The Treasure of the Sierra Madre. And for our baseball series, Moneyball with Brad Pitt. Have I told you lately how much I love that movie? Oh uh, Yeah, I think you have. Plus our Magician series and Heist film series had adaptations as well tons of page to screen gems listeners can find the details and links to the original material at the next reel.com slash originals every book play or movie you buy through our links helps support the show and it's no extra cost to you so dive in and get your next read today the next reel.com slash originals has all the films adapted from other sources that not only we have covered but all of the shows on the next reel family of podcasts Check it out and get reading. Support the show and build your reading list. It's a win-win. Head to thenextreel.com slash originals.